I'll open a, in a second. I just want to just a couple in a, a couple of weeks. Things are coming up. I want you to just put on your radar. Uh, we'll be having the first, uh, I think, public rollout of the um, of the by, by, uh, the uh, Centennial Committee of the Balboa Park. Uh, it's being vetted throughout various organizations now, but we're going to have a public rollout, and I think people are going to get really excited about what we're going to be doing for 2015. Um, in the next. I hope week, maybe 10 days, uh, the mayor of Tijuana and I. Where's our flag? It should be. I can't, I don't do anything with my, by, with my Olympic flag. <laughs> <laughs> Even if we lose, we win. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you. The uh, the uh, the mayor of uh, Tijuana and I will each be announcing our uh, own respective uh, parts of our binational committee to begin to work on the uh, binational Olympic proposal. Uh, as many of you know, I did meet with uh, Governor Romney. He was very gracious about coming over to City Hall and talking, and he will uh, advise us on matters. He's already, you know, let us know who we should be talking to at all the right places. So uh, he's got obviously a wealth of information. He's a little worried if Boston submits a bid of divided loyalties, but we'll, we'll deal with that. And uh, we'll be announcing, I hope tomorrow, may, uh, our new uh, executive uh, director for our Arts and Culture Commission. So those are things coming up. I'm open to any questions you got. I'm sorry. Did he? Uh, what was? He asked you to wait. wait for what? Instead, you know, wait maybe four, eight years. <laughs> <laughs> no, neither of us will be around then. Um, <laughs> no, I mean he was very uh, again cooperative, supportive. Uh, lots of information. He gave us some reality checks, <laughs> but also gave me the sense that uh, this is a, this is a doable thing. That this is. Uh, not beyond our ability at least to compete and uh, uh, we're putting together uh, you know as, as he said uh, you want to make something exciting and different about our bid and there's never been a binational committee before a um, binational Olympics before and uh, and there's also ways to deal with uh, the existing rules but we would like to change the rules that is if you have a uh, uh, one of our two cities could be the basic, uh, the basic bidder with venues being held in the other city. But I, I, I think, you know, the hallmark of the Olympics is international cooperation. What could be more a statement of international cooperation than two countries doing this together? So I'm hopeful that we'll be able to uh, deal. we got time to deal with the, uh, the International Olympic Committee and their rules and, and uh, bylaws. Uh, we're going to make a serious effort at this. Uh, I've talked to people... Uh, not only Governor Romney, other names he gave me, um, about the realities and how much money you need and all that and the infrastructure. And I don't think it's beyond our uh, capability or aspirations. And then we begin to look at things in this city uh, in a different light if this is a possibility. I'll just take one. I mean, the Charger Stadium that has been uh, in discussion. You look at it in a different context if you want to build a... Uh, uh, an Olympic stadium, for example, that can also be involved in football. I don't know how they look at it, but I'm, all I'm saying is we begin to look at things in different lights. We begin to look even at the uh, at the uh, celebration of Balboa Park. If we do it in also in a with a binational component, it begins to build up our credibility and our expertise and our infrastructure to uh, handle something like the Olympics. I have a question on, on infrastructure, and just because this week there have been some, um, you know, your, your proposed budget is under review, and there have been some criticism as far as the delay in bond money, the $80 million bond that you're asking to be delayed. That's money that could go to repairs for infrastructure. Why the delay, and how do you respond to folks that say, our roads can't wait, and that's the same type of financial um, decision that has us where we're at today when it comes to our roads. Who are you that you get to ask these questions? You've never even, you've never even been here before. 
Where, 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 where the hell is Bosch and Coverson, man? Where do you have these, these new guys? <laughs> uh, thank you for the question. Uh, look, uh, clearly, when I, I told our, uh, our budget people, t uh, knowing that much of the budget has been done, how are we going to deal, what, what direction we want to take? I said neighborhoods and infrastructure. And uh, I think we are going to be spending more in infrastructure than they have in the past. There, the issue of these bond, this bond is that we have issued a number of bonds or authority for a number of bonds in recent years. Uh, there's one for, I think, a couple hundred million that we have authority to that has not, no, nowhere near been spent. I mean, there's over $100 million left in the authority there. It, we, we haven't used the money that we have authority for. And to issue another bond and pay interest on it at the time when we have cash to do the infrastructure just doesn't make any sense. So I just delayed the issuance of the bond three months. So the payments will begin in, in, in the, uh, uh, not in this fiscal year. So we're not halting anything. We're not, we're not uh, delaying anything. We're just bringing, uh, making sure the bond, uh, the money that comes in is used in a, uh, in, in a, in a financially, uh, responsible way without having to pay interest on it if we don't need it yet. So we have all the money that has been previous authority that we haven't spent that we're going to use and speed up and get that out and then we'll we'll uh, issue the new bond. Why are council members saying then that without that 80 million their five-year plan that they had already voted on in effect gets halted because that's money they were counting no, on? They're just uh, I don't they just took a look at the three month delay and assumed that that's just mistaken there's not going to be any delay in any five-year plan uh, and I'll talk to them about that but it, it's just a misreading it, it's an attempt to save five million dollars in interest when we can't use the cash anyway in those three months so it's uh, it, there's no hold up of any of the things we have planned in fact we're going to try to speed stuff up I wanted to ask about the Olympic bid again. Um, you said that um, Mr. Romney pointed out some reality checks what were some of the reality checks well, uh, reality checks, I would say, uh, both on uh, what we're going to have to do, but what 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 uh, what doesn't have to be done. Or, <laughs> for example, uh, uh, some cities have built, you know, vast new uh, public uh, public uh, transportation structures, subways and light trolleys. Well, that's a credible expense. I'm not sure we could handle that. Other cities have just done buses and uh, more rapid kinds of that kind of transit. So the reality is if someone says you need a subway system, the reality is, well, that would be nice, but you can do the same thing you need to do to get athletes around the city and tourists around the city in other ways. That's what I mean by, you know, you hear things on both sides and you wonder where the reality is. And a guy like him obviously can, can give you both sides. Yeah. I mean, Beijing did the whole public, you know, they threw in, you know, uh, tens of billions, I guess, into the thing. Other cities uh, have relied a lot on private uh, philanthropy and at a far less money. So uh, that's what I meant, uh, not necessarily that we can't do it, but there's a whole range of ways that cities have undertaken, all of which have been successful, but they've taken a variety of methods to do that. Uh, um, we have some venues. We m we'll have to build other venues, but, but so that's the kind of uh, check. But and it's going to be a long process, uh, you know, many months, many months, and uh, we'll look at those as they arrive. I, I again, I think it, it's going to excite both cities, uh, and everything that we have to do to put this proposal together, we would have had to do anyway. But now we will have a focused aim. We'll have timelines. We'll have uh, an excitement. We're going to. We would have to figure out as two cities what are our assets. Not just in infrastructure, but in culture, in uh, an environment. What are our? Uh, what can we? How can we help each other multiply those assets? How? C what? What? What can we do together to bring other assets in? What? What about the border? We're going to have to solve that border for the Olympics. Why don't we solve? Just as we have to solve it for uh, uh, trade now. So this gives us though a. Uh, and, and I think the bureaucracies, like the, the federal government, will see it differently when they're talking about Olympics versus, I don't know, some abstract kind of thing. I mean, just for example, uh, why not, and I've talked to them in the past, but now I have a special or a specific uh, kind of example. 
if you have a lot of international visitors, <laughs> if, if you have a lot of international visitors uh, who come in on flights that have, uh, you know, <laughs> try this. Uh, if if you uh, if you bring in international visitors on flights that where they've gone through, you know, the TSA screening, couldn't that serve to be the screening through the border? As just an example, and you you know you you figure out stuff like that that uh, has never had a specific kind of uh, aim before. And I, I have just one follow-up question. Sorry, um, I, I noticed since since you took office that you've you know you, your first speech you started speaking Spanish. That Tijuana is definitely building a relationship a top priority. And I just wanted to know what personally motivates you. Why why are you making this top priority? Why are you pushing? Well, I can answer that in a few levels. One, uh, first and foremost, we live in this incredible binational area. I mean, people, there's, there's, there's very few places in the world that have the ability to really build on two cultures. We are the biggest binational metropolitan area in the world. And we don't talk about it or stress it or take advantage of it enough as a, as a city. Uh, the border is a cul-de-sac in California. Instead of being the center in San Diego of activity, of culture, of energy, of dynamism. Uh, so it, it's an incredible opportunity for not only for economic and trade kind of reasons, but for culture and art and history and just knowing two cultures. People pay c incredible amounts of money to go on cruises and go traveling to get that binational experience. Here, here we have it, and yet we haven't taken advantage of it. So at, at that level, obviously, uh, we want to take advantage of, uh, of who we are. Uh, we have 35%, uh, 40% uh, of our city uh, has roots in Mexico. Uh, that, that part of the population has, uh, sh we should, uh, you know, understand, recognize, and, 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 and have to be more included in the kind of uh, uh, things we do as a city. And that binational thing brings them more in, into it also. Uh, so, I mean, those are the kinds of things uh, I'm interested in. And, I mean, we just have this incredible opportunity as a city to build on this. Uh, again, ver no city I've ever lived in had that kind of environment before. And uh, we simply uh, don't know enough about it. We're, uh, there's a little, there's a ignorance, there's a fear, and we have to, I think, break all that down. Kelly, you were, uh, I'm sorry. Since you were uh, talking about Rami, I'm just gonna see into a, a La Jolla question here. Our bid group, the Merchants Association, announced some uh, good news for La Jolla yesterday. They said they had, had been in discussions with you and that you have a temporary solution for the cove odor issue uh, that you hope to have online by Memorial Day, and then maybe, say, six months down the road, maybe a more permanent solution to that problem. So I was wondering if you could share any details about that. We go from the sublime to the poop. Yeah. Uh, look, I mean, this is, a, this is just a, a, something that shouldn't exist. <laughs> I mean, because we had to put a fence to keep people off rocks in La Jolla, then birds came more, <laughs> and then there's poop that doesn't go away, and then there's a smell that permeates the area, and it just, it's a, it's a real problem for the merchants and the uh, residents there. And uh, I have been threatening various bureaucracies that I'm just going to go and clean it up no matter what permits and stuff are necessary. Uh, so uh, we think we have all the necessary permits lined up both from water and air and NOAA and all this. And uh, we're, we have a, uh, someone who's expert at vacuuming this stuff up that we're going to hire. So will be the vacuuming solution? Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. And we, uh, we, th we hope we can do it by, uh, by Memorial Day. Right. Uh, do you, can you share any more details about the, the vacuuming and how that process would work? Is it, would, you, would it be a dry vacuum, something that would use water? I, I don't know. We'll find out. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure. I'm sorry. Okay. And just following up on that. Just but this is something we should have solved many, right. many months ago, and, I just, and we just got to get it off of our off of our rocks, off, off of our so plot table. Yeah. Um, so on La Jolla, but we think we have everything legally lined up, so I don't have to go up there with my little Hoover vacuum cleaner and do it. Yeah. That's Which I was prepared to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, the SEAL cam, uh, the lifeguard tower that that's mounted atop is, is scheduled to be demolished next month. 
So I'm just wondering, uh, and you know, the city has said that they want to take that over. So what will happen? Will that stay down until the tower is done, or will you find a new location? Yeah, well, we're for we're that? looking for a location right now that it can continue in operation. Uh, so it's, okay. we, I, I hope we can. I'm not sure that we can, but I hope we can. So I hope it won't stop on May 15th. Okay, they don't want any disruption. Right. Uh, Although you know, we'll say, well, it's, it's just a technical problem. We'll figure it out. But people have become dependent on the seal cam. You know. I walk into offices and uh, homes, and people ha have this, this, this watching these seals day in and day out. It's great. By the way, if you haven't watched the seals on Channel 24, where, is Channel 24 here? Who, who picks the music for, for the seals? I mean, I don't know who picks this funky music, but it is incredible. And it looks like the seals and their pups are dancing to this music because we have music going on. It's not just the. So, Watch tw Channel 24. It's a it's an incredible uh, uh, thing. I just I watch the seals all the time. So Kelly Brown. Then I don't have to watch the city council. So Kelly Brown announced to, announced today that he was leaving development services. Have you begun the process of replacing him? And how does this affect your ability to split uh, planning from development services? Yeah. Uh, well, Kelly told us I guess uh, in that last day or two that uh, he has a new job at uh, I guess the s director of whatever at uh, I'm not sure what they call it Chula Vista. So we're, uh, we wish him well. We're sorry to see him go. He's done a great job for San Diego, but he saw this opportunity in Chula Vista. Uh, we are, we are go, uh, in, the, in the process of finally vetting our reorganization of, uh, of our department of um, sustainable neighborhoods. <laughs> we don't have a... We, no, no, no. We don't have. It's, it, it's something like the Department of Health, Safety, and so so uh, we'll have that name soon. But uh, we are in the process of reorganizing, um, you know, all the boxes and the people within that. And uh, uh, we will be. We will obviously appoint an inter interim director. We have asked Kelly to stay another month, and uh, we'll have an interim person, and then see how this organization how we uh, have to advertise or who can fill that from within in the various positions we've set up. Who's been working on that reorganization? Uh, me and uh, uh, mainly Alan Jones and my staff. Yeah, so they haven't hired any consultants or anything like no. that? No. Okay. I don't need no stinking consultants. So then the, the community plan update process, update process would run through this newly created department. Right, yeah. yeah. I have a couple questions. Did you get a haircut? I did. You've <laughs> <laughs> been very... Uh, Nerdy. I'm, I'm no, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I have a couple of questions about homelessness. Um, what have you done with the? You were talking about doing some um, collaboration with the local congressional representatives to lobby HUD to change the formulas for San Diego's funding to the continuum of care. What's uh, what's happened on that in the last few months? Okay, you put in one sentence, Congress and what's happening. Not a good. Nothing happens in Congress. I, I mean, I don't know what's happening. Uh, we're, tr we're, we're trying to, uh, we're working with them to change the, uh, the formula on which that basis, but that's, you know, a bureaucratic thing. Who knows how long it'll take, but we're working in, it's not dissuading us. Uh, we have been meeting with uh, federal officials lately on uh, things that will allow them to support us better. Uh, the, uh, and... Uh, the First Lady has been meeting with the federal officials uh, on, a, on a very regular basis. I mean, for example, uh, I'll just this one example. We, uh, we apparently put too much stress as far as the federal guidelines go on uh, transitional as opposed to permanent housing, just as one example. So we're going to have to make sure our goals and our policies meet that, and then they will fund us more. So that's, uh, that's, that's, pretty, that's just one kind of thing. Yeah, that's a perfect model. They love uh, the federal officials have loved that model, and we're going to try to expand that. Uh, I hope. As, uh, when I was chairman of the uh, the Veterans Committee in the Congress, I had wrote a policy which the president, President Obama, adopted and the VA adopted of a uh, zero. They call, we call it zero tolerance for veterans homelessness within five years. And we're in, I think, the second year of that, and I'm I I have I am hoping. That and uh, that we will be the first city in America that says we have no veterans on the street homeless in San Diego, and we're trying to get a uh, situation where we can, in fact, uh, produce that result. So, do you want to keep the vet tent open year round? 
Yeah, but uh, I want to move beyond that into more permanent kinds of situation, a more, this name tent does not ring too loudly, but uh, until we get to that situation, we would, we need, I'd like to keep the tent and the, uh, the, so the other so-called winter shelter open all year round. So you would try to find about 600000 or so, the IDA estimated it would cost yeah. to put the veterans tent up in the room. The, uh, the first one is in the budget. Right. I'm not sure. The second one, I don't think, is it, do you remember if that's? I don't think we have that in the budget yet. We will. We have to look at that. What about um, there is a, an operations gap at Connections at this permanent facility that the city has commissioned and built? Um, would that be? Some, would you imagine the city finding more money? Um, well, I hope so. I, I don't know that, but I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll need to look at that. Yeah. But you know, I'm committed to uh, to really uh, doing more. I mean, it's it's a, it's not only uh, it's an economic obviously necessity, but it's a moral necessity also. Yes, sir. Mayor, do you have any second you thoughts about wanting to see the city attorney's <coughs> budget cut? Yesterday at the council hearing, a member suggested that uh, that your move was more uh, politically than fiscally oriented, and uh, they, they wondered cynical. about your. They're very cynical. Well, yeah. you, you of course yeah. do not adopt that cynical. No, sir. Oh. No, sir. Skeptical, but not cynical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I watched some of that debate on uh, uh, yesterday. Um, if you watch on 24, by the way, you get the. <laughs> They get the music and the seals at the same. I mean, we're splitting the screen, and you know. Uh, I, I thought I thought the debate was a little bit uh, strange in, in in terms of the reality. I mean, I, I you know the whole issue that somehow people were targeted. I I thought Mr. Estrada handled that well. That I mean, we didn't. Nobody even knows the people who do the budget still don't know who were those people. I thought Mr. Uh, Mr. Alvarez's question, by the way, of how anybody knows what the people were, so how they found that information out, I think that's sort of confidential, right? I don't know how anybody knows what people were involved. They were just used as an examples. And in fact, there, it was 13 positions. And what we did, I think, was there's 23 vacancies now, and they took 13 positions from the same classification where those vacancies are to show how you can cut without affecting any of the operations. If so, I mean, there are vacancies there. You know, the, the attorney was very, what shall I say, reluctant to say, well, I mean, how much that they were saving by those vacancies. You know, he was very, I don't know that we'll get that. And we'll see. We'll get that information. But um, uh, it, it, he looked very defensive on that score. And, and nobody really honed in on the sense that uh, there are vacancies. They've been there for a while. If he doesn't need them, then we should save the money from in the budget. And uh, again, of all the departments in our, our government, that's the one that hasn't taken any of the cuts over the last uh, five, six years. And I was trying to just bring that into reality with the uh, uh, into in that budget reality into play. Uh, Do you buy his arguments that it's a more efficient uh, office now that they're bringing back all kinds of uh, bacon for the city that uh, they're I operating seen, at maximum I mean, efficiency? And uh, frankly, I haven't seen any. I haven't seen a lot of evidence of that. I don't, you know. You didn't see his budget, no. no, I mean, all I've seen in recent months since I've been mayor are losses in court. In fact, a, uh, in fact, uh, lectures from the judge on how incompetent the the representation has been. I've seen requests for outside counsel. If you keep requesting outside counsel, I mean, how good is your inside stuff? So I, I haven't seen uh, the kind of high-quality efficiency that is being claimed. I mean, I see evidence on, on the reverse. And, uh, and again, I, I, I think he's having what, what someone told me he's having a press conference today. I, I mean, I don't, if the city attorney should be working on legal matters and not press, uh, press, uh, press conferences. Uh, I just don't understand that. If he, if he needs all those, that legal help, go do the legal work. There's press people in there in that operation. I'm not sure why they need them. I mean, there's all kinds of ways to cut that budget without looking at the legal situation. Uh, following up, if uh, could you clarify, uh, Mr. Alvarez mentioned yesterday in the arguments about the executive assistant city attorney that you did not ask him or tell him to go sit in the back of the room. You told him to go sit down. What yeah. actually happened in that session? Well, you know, we're did supposed to. Did you tell to him to go sit in the back of the room no, no, or just I never, sit down? Look. Since you know we're not supposed to discuss closed session, and and, and and the attorney in fact violated his own rules by talking about it. Uh, look, uh, let me. T how shall I phrase this? 
The city attorney has arranged. <laughs> I'll give you more information you want to know. The, ge the geometry of the closed session is such that the city attorney tries to intimidate the council. He sits here. He's got someone sitting there. He's got someone sitting there. He's got someone at the microphone all the time. So I asked the guy at the microphone, stop standing at the microphone. You keep interrupting a session, which I am the chair of, and I don't even have a chance to recognize him. He just comes in, and it's a means of intimidating the council. Council members aren't allowed to have anybody else in the closed session but themselves. The attorney has dozens of people in there. Uh, and I think it's more intimidation than, uh, than help. And I asked this one attorney who was at, he, he seems to stand at the microphone. I said, sit down until you recognize, please. And uh, I mean, and he said, I won't sit down until the attorney tells me to sit down. So I asked the attorney to tell him to sit down. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's the way, frankly, the attorney, both with press conferences and the way he leaks information and other things, uh, he's interfering in the policy making of the city rather than being the legal advisor to the city. And he, they run the closed session, they run the council sessions, they run the press conferences in all that way, and we have to come to grips with that. Yes, we, and, and every other city that has an elected city attorney has the same problems, by the way. It's not, this is not new or just uh, because of me and he, because of me and him. Uh, an elected attorney tends to want to interfere in the policy more than they 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 should in, in in the view of the policymakers. So it's a it's it's a tension that's always around. Uh, I think he's overstepped the line. Uh, I think uh, again in these press in, in the way the, the sessions are run and the press conferences and the way he 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 gives information to the press before he gives it to his clients. All those are in instances where. I'm not sure uh, it's a very productive uh, way to be the, the city attorney. Is Lee Burdick practicing law without a license as a member of your staff <laughs> in violation of Section 40 of the city charter? No. <laughs> Lee Burdick is a uh, staff member of mine. She has a law degree, and she's practiced law. Uh, I've had, I have other people on my staff who are, uh, this guy here has a law degree. Uh, Vince Hall. But the uh, claim is she's uh, been giving legal the, the, analysis, she's been giving interviews look, that, uh, that supersede or at least uh, uh, raise conflicts with his deputies who should be giving those answers. Well, you know, he's, he's giving policy advice which uh, interferes with my policy advisors, so I think that's more the problem. I mean, Mayor Sanders had all kinds of legal uh, lawyers on his staff. Uh, every mayor has had uh, legal things, but, you know, he just raises this because he does not want any other opinion on anything he issues to be considered. And we know that he's has problems with this. That is, he gave me, a, he gave me, by the way, a, 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 an opinion on uh, the, port, the port that said, yes, you may veto. So I vetoed him. <laughs> of course, he gave me a pressure. Then he issues another opinion in which he republished and vacated the previous opinion. Hello? How can you say then that we should only listen to you when you, I'm going to bring that, you know, he republishes and vacates. So whenever he says something, I say, are you going to republish and vacate that? That is, he says he's infallible when it comes to law, and he's the only one. He's, that's what he's telling you by the charter that can give me advice. He makes too many mistakes for me to take his advice only, I'll tell you. Considering revising the, the cuts to the city attorney's office, or will that? I don't see any reason to. Uh, that's my proposal. I have, I have another budget budget question for you. Um, the IBA is giving a report today on the convention center that says it spent all of its reserves on the expansion, and the IBA recommends rebuilding that reserve fund. Um, I'm wondering. If you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I haven't seen her report yet, but uh, I mean, we'll look at that. Uh, I just when I, I someone said something to me, I looked at the uh, our budget. Uh, we we had uh, over the years a million or two or whatever three in, in reserves, and that is not there's no reserve there now. We do um, give approximately over three million dollars a year to uh, help subsidize their operation. Now uh, we pay almost thirteen million dollars of. Uh, uh, on the bond uh, payments. So we are contributing significantly to the convention center operation, so I'm not sure what 
we she wants to do more uh so I, i'll have to read her report i mean we are we, you know we have at least this year's budget 16 million going to the convention center so i don't know what more we, we need to do uh, i mean i don't know i'll have to look at what she's talking about she was saying that they should use some of the money instead of making capital repairs to replenish this reserve who th they should the, the IBA was saying that the convention center oh maybe they should oh I thought you were saying that the city should do that no. oh Sorry. yeah uh, I, I, you know that's their decision I am told that there are lots of problems in, the, in their cap in, in that you know a lot of repairs that have to be made those iconic s sales that are out there are have a certain lifespan it turns out and we don't want them to fall down <laughs> following up on the development services department changes there and college departure um, I'm wondering if the city is going to be uh, looking at the process of historic preservation in regard to that recent state audit and if there's going to be any changes made there. Um, that was largely commissioned by, uh, by Walmart going in, but I know in La Jolla that's a big <coughs> issue specifically with the preservation of historic, potentially yeah. historic residences. I mean, I, I think uh, you're talking about the same report I'm, I'm familiar with, and we said we were going to try to do well, all... Right, do all the uh, recommendations they have, and yes, historical preservation will, is a central part of what we, what I think to be is the quality of life in in neighborhoods. So that's going to be a central part of the new division that we're setting up. Uh, particularly in La Jolla, I yeah. feel a lot of well, there's other places. Yeah. Feel it's too easy to have a structure deemed historically, you know, um, having suffered a loss of integrity because maybe one or two minor things have been changed just doing regular remodeling and upkeep of the right. property through the years. No, we're going to bring just, uh, we will bring several, what shall I say, functions or departments or agencies into a more central part of planning, whether it's historical preservation, whether it's pedestrian friendliness, uh, uh, you know, bike bikeability. Those things will become far more central to the whole process. So what specifically do you see as the advantage of the new setup? What, what, do, we, what do we gain out of it that we don't have in the current... Well, how long do we have here? Uh, look, the, the Mayor Sanders abolished basically the planning department, folded it into development services. If you look at the mission of the development services department, it is basically to give a permit. I think the mission of a central planning department, a central department that's going to be involved in planning has to be way beyond that. It has to be, it has to do with the quality of life of neighborhoods. What, what, what are we doing about, uh, you know, maintaining small business, economic development, historic preservation, bikeability, walkability, uh, economic development? Uh, all those things should be central. And we have reached a stage anyway in San Diego, I think regardless of, of, me, of me and my beliefs, uh, you know, we have expanded into our suburbs virtually as much as we we're going to do and we have to talk about infill and quality of life in established neighborhoods and the design standards that's another one i you know are just they're not part of our basic process uh as an example in, in north park they want to take out a lane of uh parking and use that lane for pedestrian things cafe seating parklets and yet the first thing that that D Department of Development Services does is a traffic study, and the first criteria is traffic, uh, the level of traffic, A, B, C, D. Well, they want to slow up traffic. They want pedestrians. They want the, the small businesses to have more of an act, have people accessing them. So the traffic flow is not central to them. <laughs> and yet that's how we're oriented. So we want to put just different priorities in place for livable neighborhoods. Would it have the effect of speeding up the community plan updates? I, yeah, I, well, I mean, I would like to. I think we have to. And I would look at the uh, at that in a number of ways, by the way. Uh, first and foremost, most of the plans that need to be updated are have, have uh, very um, key pressure points in those communities, it's where the development or the infill has taken place. Ninety percent of the, of the plan doesn't. There's not going to be any change. So if we just concentrated on those pressure points, we would get them done faster and cheaper. And that's what I'm going to try to do in this new department. I have a question about medical marijuana. Who um, are you? Where? <laughs> are you back? I <laughs> <laughs> just, um, just my joke. I'm Christian. Christian I'm just being funny. Okay. 
Yeah, you're, you're, you're I know who you are. You're, okay. <laughs> you're just my straight man for the day. Okay. <laughs> um, we're going to change your name to Jewish. What's, anyway. uh, what's, uh, what's the progress like in, in drafting in the drafting of the medical or um, marijuana ordinance? Um, and, and what can you tell folks that you know we're kind of shocked to see that one raid after the, the day after the city was talking about drafting the medical marijuana ordinance? A lot of people thought it wasn't a coincidence. Yeah, I would. Uh, second question first. I was very disheartened by that raid. It, it just struck me as a uh, way over uh, use of police authority. I mean, to have guys in masky masks and stuff. I mean, it just it just looked horrible. Uh, and I just expressed my dismay to both the sheriff and the head of the DEA and the attorney general and the president about that. They have not responded yet, but uh, so and it turns out that the the guy they raided was one who testified the day before, and it looked like retaliation. I don't know that it was. Usually they plan these things more in advance, but it certainly looked bad. And I think they should have just postponed whatever they were going to do if uh, they felt they had to do it. Although I think they overdid it anyway. Uh, so I thought that was way way out of bounds, and uh, I was really upset also that. Both the uh, the sheriff and the um, the DEA did not bother to let the mayor or our police officials know that they were doing this. I mean, there ought to be some sense of of you're moving into a a different jurisdiction. And let us know what's going on. Uh, I still have hope for a balanced init uh, ordinance with regard to access to medical marijuana. What I'll call you know re uh, regulated, well regulated access. That is, I think our humanitarian uh, concerns should be met. I, I've met literally hundreds of people who uh, need for control of pain and their chronic illness uh, medical marijuana. And I try to uh, regulate that through both uh, not only the need for a doctor's uh, uh, prescription, but a, uh, a, uh, a registry in person at the Department of Health Services at the county and, and a computer registry that could be ch checked for uh, that a high a permit fee and ex and then a, an excise tax to help fund all that so uh, and but to keep those uh, establishments out of residential neighborhoods and from where children and schools and playgrounds are so I thought we had a balanced approach and I hope the council the council uh, uh, is not finished with that process. Uh, there's still a long way to go, so we will see uh, uh, if we can get a, uh, a, a balanced approach uh, enacted into law. How soon would you like for it to Tomorrow. But, uh, no, it's, I mean, I don't know. They, they send it over to the city attorney uh, with all those vacancies. I don't know. Maybe he won't be able to do it. Uh, I don't know if he'll, he'll, it'll be lost there or not. <laughs> On that, have you made any effort to talk to Laura Duffy um, or she to you to come to any kind of understanding if for nothing so simple as, as you mentioned, the courtesy of uh, yeah. advance? Unfortunately not. We have not. Would you try it? Why not? I just haven't gotten to it. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, we should have that conversation. I had a question about police staffing levels. Uh, so there's a hearing last week at the uh, budget committee, or the public safety committee. You know, there's 1,800 officers, 900 of them are eligible to retire in the next four years. Uh, they're having trouble retaining younger officers. 35 have left for other departments in the last three years. And you know, the solution under Sanders was to increase the recruiting class. You decided to do that. You bump it up even more in your new budget. But even at, at the hearing, police officers were saying that's great, but it's not going to solve the situation because you have these 900 officers that are going to potentially retire in the next four years. So what can you do as mayor? I mean, the answer is compensation, but there's really not a whole lot of will at, on the city council to increase pay for employees. So how do you fix that problem? It seems like it's coming down the track. Next question. <laughs> well, there will be plenty of opportunities when the UT uh, fires all its people. So. Uh, it's a joke, guys. Uh, look, we, we are dangerously low at staffing levels. We are, our compensation levels are beyond dangerously low. 
people leave. There's been a net loss every week for the you know, last years of, uh, of officers. That's now hitting also the fire department. Uh, so, and we've, we have a net loss of people. We train them. It costs $100,000, $150,000 to train them, and then they go off. And the firefighters, I think we're the only agency in the county or the, our part of the state, for example, that doesn't have a, a real pension system because of Prop B. So that's, that's the issue. So I, I got to work on three things, it looks like to me. Well, number one, staffing levels. Number two, equipment, because that affects morale and their ability to do the job. And three, compensation. And I'm trying to work on all of them within an existing budget that is very, you know, that's very constrained. Uh, uh, actually, I, I misstated what I had told our budget people earlier. I said, I want two things taken care of, infrastructure and public safety. And we bumped up a, a whole bunch of stuff in public safety in both equipment and in, in uh, staffing, you know, in the academy. Uh, I think the council, by the way, understands these, these the, the recruitment issues. And I think you'll, uh, I think you'll see in any uh, final labor agreement that the uh, public safety people are going to be put first. <laughs> In terms of uh, immediate try uh, gains in their uh, in their employment uh, in their compensation, so we got to try to stem the tide, and I'm not, we're not going fast enough. And I'm going to try to go as fast as we can. And a follow up to that: the, the I was told there's a new labor offer from the city in closed session was made to the unions. Can we talk a little bit about that. No. <laughs> has, has an offer been made? Uh, there's a, there's, meet, there's meetings this week, and I think uh, uh, yeah, that we we have uh, we are making an offer. Um, it's a uh, it's a five year offer. That uh, by the way, again, I, I think this uh, if I can use the opportunity, a five year plan which uh, the council for the first time endorsed in this week's offer is really crucial for our financial health. Uh, I mean, it's good for labor stability, obviously, because we have uh, more flexibility. We can do things for employees over a longer period of time than we can do in, say, one year. Our outlook on the third, fourth, and fifth years is much brighter than the first two, so we can look out and see uh, surpluses, for example. And most important, because of the, st the certainty of a five-year contract, the, uh, the uh, pension uh, obligations of the city are calculated differently and that calculation will allow us in the next three years to put in 60 million dollars of extra money I mean it moves forward all of the uh, payments it, it, it changes the the way we make the payments without uh, without going into more detail because I don't understand more detail but uh, it moves up 60 million dollars in the next three years 25 25 and 10 that's an incredible amount of money in the budgets that we have and I don't understand, I didn't understand those who uh, were hesitant on a five-year deal to, to, to give up this, it's literally free money uh, because of just a calculated differently. And, and we, we will have, tw if we get a five-year deal, we have $25 million more to do all the issues that you guys raise, whether it's infrastructure, cops, uh, employee compensation, uh, what, uh, poop. <laughs> uh, we can do we can do more if we get a five-year plan. So it's really crucial that we do that. I'm hopeful that uh, now we've made a five-year offer that uh, we can agree on the details of it over the next couple weeks. Mayor, sure. could you talk about the uh, fourth floor incubator <laughs> project and how a team would get in? Or have you set up something if anybody was interested? By the way, you guys, uh, all your cameras, you should stop on, uh, on the fourth floor as you leave on the fourth floor of this building. I don't know if you, when I said that the, part, the um, previous mayor, um, would you make sure the door's open? <laughs> the, uh, the previous mayor uh, abolished the planning department and that was mostly on the fourth floor. So you walk in, it's like a neutron bomb hit the fourth floor. There's no people there, it's, but there's all these desks and, you know, and, uh, uh, and bookshelves and chairs. It's got, I don't know, 150 cubicles and nobody's there. Sort of metaphor for me on my previous uh, administration. But uh, so I decided we should use the floor for, and I'm not sure of the word yet, incubator laboratory center for um, 
urban initiatives and a new civic imagination. That is, every polit- political figure, I mean, and you guys in your work, you, 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 you learn about interesting ideas, creative ideas, ideas which uh, are outside the box, I guess we would say, and cross over all the bureaucratic silos that we're in. And I said, why not have a place where we can break down those silos, where we can have creative ideas, where we can bring in, where people have a space to talk about things, like Binational Olympics, like uh, our new organization for the uh, for uh, planning in this in this city, like uh, the Ciclo Ciclos Dias we were starting. That is the bike bike. Uh, days that we're going to uh, block off traffic and have people walk, talk, and uh, bike and enjoy themselves in a new way. Uh, Places where we can mentor uh, young people in leadership. Places where uh, entrepreneurs can have space, incubator space to begin startups. I mean, all these things, and, you know, we can multiply that out by, by many. Because I've met every one of these ideas. I've come into contact with people. I say, I wish we had a place where we can do that. So we're going to use the fourth floor for that if the city council uh, provides me with a little money to <laughs> to start it. But uh, you should go s- go see what, what, what I'm trying to do there. We have a little sign up there, but you can see how empty it is and ho- how we can create a new ma- imagination. I'll just give you one little example that, that led to this. Uh, Three students from the New School of Architecture came to see me on one of my Saturday <laughs> open days, and they're doing a master's thesis. And they said, "We're going to create a whole block down in downtown. It was, uh, they, well, it'll be in East Village, where they had they had all these pictures of an architecture based on shipping containers and neon signs and lunch carts, and it was going to be and, and cafe seating and park of uh, grassland. It was going to be a great gathering place in downtown." And all they wanted from me was city block, or half a city block. I'm a strong mayor, so I gave them a city block. Uh, but for, they're going to construct, and it'll be up in uh, 30, 60 days, a whole new gathering place for downtown that is going to be remarkable. You, sh- so you should interview these three incredible guys. I, I was visited by 20-something geeks, I'll call them. I mean, new startup, <laughs> new startup uh, entrepreneurs who were geniuses in you know the computers and and video and all that. And they w- they were looking for. They had they put together a uh, an association, but needed an incubator space. So I started putting all this stuff together and and came up with this laboratory on the fourth floor. That I and, and I hope city employees will you know be able to come and talk about new ideas and want to break down some of the bureaucratic stuff that we've we're boxed into. How do you know? Ooh, thank you. <laughs> park and market. Wait, wait. Park and oh, okay. Uh, did, did did you? Publish the pictures and stuff that they, they their renderings. I could I hadn't seen it. Yeah, they published the engineer and these orange triangle things sitting on top of the <laughs> <Orange> ship. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's going to be really exciting, I think. It shows what we can do with vacant lots and empty space, and that's what that's what I want this uh, incubator to do. I mean, City Heights, we uh, the kids wanted a skate park, so we took a little almost an alley and uh, and and said, okay, you've. Which, and we changed the quality of life in those neighborhoods just with these kinds of things. I was hoping you could address a, a change at the bid council. Um, as, as part of the budget cuts, uh, $185,000 was cut from their 2013-14 budget. And so that basically eliminates their CEO and four staff members. And in place we'll have an <coughs> advocate, uh, Liz Studebaker, formerly with North Park Main Street Association, coming on board. So I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about what that transition will look like for the duties, and maybe if she'll only be working with the bid council or she'll have other duties in your office. Because she'll be working out of your office, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, just quickly, uh, we have to end after this. Um, we, we, I'm a strong supporter of the business improvement districts and the neighborhood kind of um, energy that that generates and the support for business that it generates. We thought that the way the bid council had evolved it sort of became a lobbying organization for bids, and you're begging the city for help. I'm saying, why shouldn't support for the bids be right in the city structure? So rather than have an outside consultant 
we put we have now an inside advocate, Liz Studebaker, uh, who will be organizing the other departments and making sure that our whole city is supporting the bids, not just a bid council. So we'll be supporting the council, but we want to do it in a far more effective way. And she'll be just will she be working on other tasks? Yeah, yeah, well, but mainly that, how would you define it? Well, she'll be working on the economic development division. Okay. Yeah. I guess there was a concern that maybe there might be, you know, she, there might be a little bit of a conflict, like she wouldn't be in the mayor's office. Would she really be an advocate for the businesses or for the interests of the city when they need to cut money or? No, or she's going to be a bid advocate. Yeah, she That's, will be. Yep. And look at that as economic development kinds of. Uh, right. yeah. and, and just really quickly, it was my understanding that. I guess there were two such bid advocates that have been on the city payroll for maybe like 20 years, but the bid council had never heard from them. Do you know anything about that? I, I guess don't know. I guess, I guess they weren't good advocates. That's why we haven't, I don't know who, who those were. Or anything. No, you hadn't heard anything about that. Okay. But that restructuring, does it uh, reflect some kind of a budget cut or, or less money toward the process or for small business development? No, we, we transferred the money from uh, you know from an outside consultant basically to an inside employee, who will be able to marshal the whole city uh, organization on behalf of bids. Yes, ma'am. We just hope it'll be more dynamic and they'll think bigger and we're going to have a lot more public support for uh, and you know city support i mean the budget was increased by almost two million dollars for the arts so well that that i mean everybody can relook at that as we we go along i think we're going to have a very creative uh broad compre broadly thinking person who will uh take that to new heights we'll announce it i think tomorrow Ha, ha, ha.